Carl, hi there. I've been reading about uh, some of this laser disc information, and I thought this would make an interesting topic. Rose, what is this funny looking thing? The laser disc. Pete, that's a laser disc for people who want the very best picture when they watch movies, and we're stocking them now. Are discs such as this one available right now? Really? You bought those on my day off, didn't you? This laser disc, virtually indestructible. I wanted to move us into 23rd century technology and give the people at Greenfield a better choice of home entertainment. If the music don't sound good, who cares what the picture looks like? Just wait till you take a day off. You're looking at the future. What home entertainment has never been, but what it will be for the coming decades. You're looking at me on laser disc, a new technology that may be the most important entertainment media and educational tool yet devised. A system that makes a reality of the unfulfilled dreams of television. And we're proud to say that it's made by Pioneer. The future, unfulfilled dreams, is Pioneer promising too much? Stay with us a few minutes. You may decide we aren't boasting nearly enough. Yes, I can understand you. I'm Leonard Nimoy. Interesting. A record player that produces beautiful sound and pictures through my TV. What is it called? Ah, Magnavision. We're going to look at this machine right here, which was actually the old first Magnavox machine that came out in about 1979. And we awaited these things with bated breath because we heard about video disc players and all this stuff for years and years. And we waited a long time before they were perfected enough to come out on the market and actually be sold uh, widespread. We first turned the power button on. Which, which is right over here on the end, and the picture goes black. The disc is now warming up. Over here, you have two lights that have come on for your audio channels, left and right channels. And now here's our picture starts. This is the old DiscoVision logo. Let me give you some sound over here. This intro was actually dumped in about 1981 or so, in favor of the new generic laser vision logo. And now our movie starts. We're Devo, and it's our business to keep up with the state of the art in audio and video equipment. Well, there's, there's so much to tell you, but let's begin at the source. Now, this is a laser disc. It looks like a phonograph record, but it isn't that at all. The laser disc system delivers both an exceptional picture and high fidelity audio track by means of a laser beam. On the other side of this demonstration disc, you found out about the fact that Pioneer's disc player is based on the laser, so perhaps the place to start is, what is a laser? Well, the word laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, laser. In the Pioneer player, the laser beam is emitted from a helium neon laser tube that looks like this. Looks sort of like a fluorescent lamp, doesn't it? In this drawing, that's the laser tube. From it, a single laser beam passes through a grating that breaks the beam up into several beams. Three of them then pass through a prism and are guided by two mirrors and a lens that focuses the beam down to one thirty thousandth of an inch onto the reflective surface of the laser disc itself. Then microscopic pits on the surface interrupt the beam and reflect some of it back through the mirrors. When the reflected beam reaches the prism, it's deflected onto a device that converts the optical beam into a frequency modulated signal that contains both the sound and picture information. The same information that was encoded on the disc when it was made. From an original signal, to an optical signal, to a reproduced signal. That's the whole remarkable idea behind the laser disc. Laser disc was something that I first encountered in, wow, well, must have been like right on the cusp of like the 80s. I was hanging out in a video studio uh, rental store on a regular basis, one of the early uh, video rental places, and there was a MCA DiscoVision player on the premises, and it always had a copy of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band 
ripping at all times to try and convince customers that this was the format of the, the future. The wake of all these competitors, uh, MCA and Philips decided to team up, and Philips would handle making the players eventually under the Magnavox brand, or Magnavision, and then MCA would handle all the software, the Disco Vision disc. So it was this perfect meeting. The only problem is that just stuff wasn't ready. And the plants that they had for manufacturing the discs were not clean plants at all. <laughs> and the discs that ended up getting uh, produced and eventually launched in 1978 in December uh, were barely ready. And, and the defect rate was, was huge. I mean, <laughs> they were just hemorrhaging money on this this project. Uh, the, the plant they used used to you know make furniture, so it was loaded with sawdust particles. And I think it was 10% of the discs were like quality, perfect discs. Around this time, IBM also got involved, uh, and they joined together and created DiscoVision Associates. At the time, DiscoVision was only available in Atlanta, Georgia. It took until the end of 1980 and a market share buyout by Pioneer for DiscoVision, or LaserVision, the name got revised in the interim, to be available nationwide. It took until mid-1981 for this system to be released in Asia, and mid-1982 for Disco Vision, Laser Vision, Laser Video Disc, Laser Disc, to make it to the European market. Uh, so it was a lot of fingers in the pie, but one of the most important fingers in the pie was Pioneer. It was actually a small company in Japan, and the main reason they got involved in the uh, you know video disc world was because they were able to create the industrial players that MCA uh, was eager to get going. And you can still get the industrial players now with the barcode scanners. They were used for a lot of education uh, purposes, too, because you could use the the you know jump to a single frame feature to jump to another like you know piece of text or an answer for a question or something like that. Uh, so Pioneer got involved in those, and then eventually they began pressing their own discs at a plant in Kofu, Japan, which is way better than the plant in uh, California. And the discs that eventually hit the market were far different than what uh, David Paul Gregg originally envisioned. Now, because of all these features, the Pioneer laser disc player is the perfect educational tool. It can teach you how to improve your golf swing, your tennis backhand, your Australian crawl. The Pioneer Laser Disc Player can even teach you a foreign language in a way that language has never been taught before. Fascinating. Now let me see if I understand you. What you're saying is that each disc carries two separate audio tracks and each one can have totally different messages on them. The rest is obvious. With the proper disc, I could actually learn a foreign language. I could watch it in English with Channel 1, go back and hear the actors speaking the same line in another language on Channel 2. What a marvelous learning tool. What is truly remarkable is that you can view each frame one frame at a time, which means you could put all the art masterpieces in all the museums in the world on one disc and see it one painting at a time. Well, it does seem they've thought of everything. But wouldn't it be wonderful if it also had stereo sound? Oh. I see. They do have stereophonic sound. But how can that be possible, with most television sets today having single speakers? Hmm. Two channels of sound. And all it takes are standard cables connected to my own stereo system. I might have known. Gary, we're watching this movie on a video disc player here, which some people would consider high technology, but the fact of the matter is this is a dinosaur. It's been a flop. They're not even making it anymore. How then is it that we can be talking about this great future of video discs and computers? So eventually, once all these discs were you know, coming out bad, uh, MCA's catalog was, was falling apart. I think the last catalog they had only had like 38 titles or whatever. It was, it was shaping up to be a bomb. And uh, Japan was still doing pretty well. They were interested in it. Pioneer was you know, pressing good discs over there. And over here... You know, Betamax and VHS, all that stuff was happening, and people were really excited about recording content and being able to watch it, watch it again, and then re-record and then do all that kind of thing. And and I think a lot of people are wary of Laserdisc because they think it's just going to be a momentary fad. There's just a lot of speculation about whether those are going to catch on. I myself really? don't know if I want one because you can't record on them, and I would like. 
yeah, the, the, the freedom of being able to record programs. Right. I don't know how many times I'm going to want to watch a full-length feature film. The laser disc system does more than offer a new technology, however. It's, it's truly the first form of personal video entertainment. Let me explain. The dream of television was to bring into our homes exactly what we wanted to see, to fulfill our own personal interests. But as television matured, programming had to, had to cater to a larger common audience. So opera, which appealed to only a small segment of the audience, all but disappeared from TV. Rock concerts, ballet, serious contemporary drama, foreign films, and Shakespeare are not there at the flick of a channel. Today, TV has become the, the land of the situation, comedy, and little else. But the pioneer laser disc player gives you the chance, finally, of seeing what you want to see, when you want to see it, right in your own home. Why would someone want it instead of tape? Why is this so revolutionary? Well, the biggest advantage that it offers, I guess basically there are three or four. One, it offers much better picture quality than does tape. Two, we're capable of providing stereophonic sound where we cannot do that off of tape. Three, the programming itself to play on the disc is very inexpensive. Uh, Full-length motion pictures such as The Electric Horseman, Saturday Night Fever, uh, Coal Miner's Daughter, twenty-four ninety-five, And there's no deterioration of picture quality. Think of resolution this way. On a still photograph, the number of dots in a given area determines the resolution and the brightness and the clarity. The greater number of dots, the higher the resolution. The same principle applies to a television screen. The greater number of lines, the greater the resolution. And Pioneer offers more lines, far more resolution than any other home video system. As unbelievable as it seems, 40% higher resolution than a home video cassette player. We don't look bad on tape. But we're much more satisfying on disc. because the Pioneer laser disc picture is 40% sharper than conventional videotape. The discs are surprisingly inexpensive. You can buy a first-run two-hour movie on disc for about the same cost as taking your family out to the movies. And on disc, the movie isn't yours for one night. It's yours forever. Now, in addition, a movie on videotape is many times more expensive than the same movie on laser disc even though tape doesn't offer nearly the quality of a laser disc picture or its sound. Is all this exciting programming available now? Really? Super concerts by top entertainers? Blockbuster films, both current and vintage? Cooking lessons, documentaries, how to do a tennis, golf, swimming and crafts? Cartoons, the arts, NFL football, interactive discs? All of them and more and far less expensive than pre-recorded videotape. And sophisticated new laser vision programming is coming soon. Well, home entertainment has never seen the likes of this before. So there you have it. Gourmet video for people who know and love video. Magnavision. Another bright idea from Magnavox. There's a great series of historical articles in this classic Laser Magic 1998 Monster Behemoth Compendium from Widescreen Review. It's got a great article called uh, World on a Silver Platter by David Robert Chalitti, uh, kind of going into the crazy behind-the-scenes world of Laserdisc and, and where it came from. And until this point... In you know 1998 or so, there had been a lot of contention over who the inventor of Laserdisc was. So yeah, basically, there was a guy. He came up with the concept. He didn't eventually um, get to envision that concept himself. It was you know taken and worked on by a num number of other people. Whether or not he would have invented Laserdisc with lasers or the way it was made and and that or cracked all the codes that needed to be cracked to make it a viable um, you know marketable product remains to be you know seen or is you know all in our imaginations um but he still deserves you know the respect and the credit for coming up with the optical storage you know idea in the first place so laser disc it's very complicated because yeah it was this failure from the early 80s and it should have been a failure just like ced 
or RCA Select Division. It could have been a failure like Betamax was a failure. Um, Pioneer is really the kind of savior of the day. So whereas David Paul Gregg is the inventor of Laserdisc, Pioneer is definitely the savior of Laserdisc. An LD surface. There are billions of tiny pits stored in the disc. A laser beam from the pickup focuses in these tiny pits very precisely, and the reflection of light is converted to electric signals for audio-video reproduction. Now you'll see how LDs are actually produced. The first stage is the production of the release master tape. This process takes place at the Tokyo-based Laser Disc Corporation, or LDC. Here, utilizing ultra-modern recording facilities, LDC engineers edit down the audio-video contents of the programs into one-inch videotapes and encode various signals for frame or chapter numbers and other disk control data. After strict inspection for noises, dropouts, sound balance and so forth, the one-inch release master tape goes to Pioneer Video Kokubo plant for mastering or production of a stamper. During the mastering process, extreme cleanliness is absolutely necessary. At Pioneer Video, therefore, all production processes are conducted in clean rooms. The process starts with a photoresist coating on the very smoothly polished glass master disc. Then, audio and video signals delivered from the release master tape are recorded in the form of bits by laser beam. In the clean room, ultimate care is taken to guarantee cleanliness, from water and materials being used to even memorandum papers for engineers, all in order to avoid damage to the tiny pits. After precise inspection, the formed stamper is delivered to Pioneer Video's head office plant for replication. The replication process also requires extreme cleanliness. Here, the stamper is placed in an injection molding machine. When acrylic plastic is injected, a replicant plastic disc called clear disc is formed. Thus, billions of tiny pits engraved on the stamper are copied to the clear disc at one time. Such clear discs are then put into a vacuum chamber which evaporates the aluminum reflective layer that covers the pits. Another protective layer is then coated on the evaporated aluminum surface after which one side of the LD is completed. The final stage is the bonding of sides 1 and 2 into one disc. The completed LD is then wrapped and shipped to the market after very strict inspection. So Pioneer eventually ended up stepping in and uh, picking up the pieces. And eventually it was a long time before MCA and, uh, and everyone let go of their patents. I think I, uh, IBM and MCA gave up the patents for LaserDisc in 1989 or so. Uh, but once Pioneer stepped in and took over, that's when things started getting interesting. That's, you know, after that, you know, the, the Criterion Collection discs started happening, which started paving the way for what Laserdisc would become in the 90s. Funny. Coming up next, we've been talking about video Laserdiscs, and you may even be feeling slightly guilty that you don't quite know what they are. Well, when we come back, we'll explain why Laserdiscs are the best next-generation technology for serious home video fans. The arrival of video discs was received with much ballyhoo on the part of producers in recent years and with very little acceptance on the part of the consumer. Now there is new hope for success. Leonard Malton has that story. Thanks to a Los Angeles-based company called Criterion, King Kong of the 30s has found his way onto laser disc of the 80s. A laser actually reads the signal electronically. There is no deterioration. No matter how many times you use it, the, the disc itself can be handled, it's virtually indestructible, and the image remains as good as it was the day you bought it for innumerable uses. 
of us want to watch a movie at home, we turn on the VCR. But a growing number of movie lovers are turning to laser disc players to get a better picture. Are laser disc players poised to make your VCR obsolete? Consumer Reports has the answer. After years of stagnant sales, laser disc players are starting to take off. <laughs> Manufacturers are hoping that these machines will do to the VCR what the compact disc did to the LP. But after examining some of the latest models, Consumer Reports says don't rush out to buy one. There are too many trade-offs. On the plus side, you do get a sharper picture. It has a much higher data rate bandwidth. So with all that extra information, it can translate into better resolution, less picture noise, and an overall better picture. Sound quality is also top-notch, so you can enjoy the movie theater experience in your own living room. Notice these things are shiny on both sides, and that was uh, one of the kind of drawbacks, uh, quote unquote, of the of the format is that in uh, the longest play mode, you only had 60 minutes per side. So in order to get a film, if it was 120 minutes, you had to flip it once, and then if it was more than 120 minutes, you had to get a, another disc and swap it out. And there was also the uh, standard play format, which was 30 minutes per side. Of course, the benefit at the time being quite a big benefit in that you could have crystal clear still frame images and slow motion. So if you were a film fan and you really wanted to check things out, nowadays we take that for granted. But if you want to see Star Wars, per se, frame by frame, that was pretty cool at the time. You see Darth Vader throw the Emperor over the balcony and you could see Darth Vader's, like... Uh, skeletal uh, remains in his you know servo motors in his hands and his face and everything like that just doing that frame by frame stuff so it was pretty cool during the early disco vision days discs were primarily intended to be and were in the cav format at 30 minutes maximum per side for a standard 12 inch disc this format allowed users to view footage at variable speeds, as well as frame by frame. This development allowed for a new, high-tech variation on microfilm and its variants, in which entire newspaper or magazine or whatever archives could be stored on a relative few discs. Another offshoot of frame by frame led to a novel, if rather costly, method of reading department store catalogs. For a couple of years in the early mid-80s, some department stores, like Sears, issued video catalogs to owners of registered Pioneer VP1000 units, or you could just visit the store, in which most individual frames would act as a page of info. Now we're entering the age of electronics, and Sears is leading the way. With this new video disc catalog, we can provide you with more and better product information than we ever could on the printed page. You can move from department to department in just a matter of seconds, or stay and browse as long as you wish. The future of catalog shopping has never been brighter. When Pioneer asserted control over the Laserdisc project in 1980, in the name of cost-cutting, they made the executive decision to switch the primary Laserdisc playback format to CLV. While this allowed for up to 60 minutes of storage per side, it also meant slowing the rotation speed and doing a little groove cramming to accommodate this extra playtime. The upshot of this is that the playback quality took a minor hit and you had to sacrifice very speed, and sacrifice still frames. Hill says the 1980s will bring an entire video system to the consumer. Now the television receiver will simply be a focal point of a system. You can watch television as you have for years, but now you can connect your video tape recorder to it, your video game to it, your video disc to it, and we see more products coming out to complete a whole video system. Of course, you've talked a bit about the laser video disc player that can play movies. Uh, that's one of the components here, uh, the system. Uh, the second part here is a uh, microcomputer, uh, which is currently marketed by Pioneer in Japan, and combining the computer graphics and the video disc imagery on the screen. Uh, right now, for example, the Sega logo and the Astron belt, which is a game program we have running here, uh, that imagery is coming from the video disc. The push button, uh, push start button and so on is coming from the computer. It's a graphic overlay. 
and tell us what you're doing as you do it. All right, we'll bring the audio up here from the coming through the computer. And you're seeing the spaceship move on the screen, which is under my control. That's a computer-generated graphic. You're looking at the world's first interactive video art game, created by artist Lynn Hirschman. Lorna is about a woman with agoraphobia who hasn't left her house in 20 years. She watches a lot of television, and in manipulating the video, the viewer begins to sense the repetitive and repressed nature of her life. Well, I think that the video disc as a technology is really exciting uh, because of the interactivity and the ability of a participant or a viewer to become active by playing with, with the technology. Lynn Hirschman is among the first artists to explore the Laserdisc as a creative medium. That's because the barriers of cost and availability of Laserdiscs have locked many others out. I think as these things happen and people see what the possibilities are and how exciting a medium it really is and how, how much truer a cut of reality it'll present, more people will do it and, and you know, they'll, they'll, uh, more, more of an audience will evolve. It always takes time. But then, again, being the first and being pioneering is real exciting, so you get that payoff, too. In the skies of every nation on the planet, a fierce battle is about to begin. A ruthless alien fleet plans to conquer the Earth, their purpose to make it their home, their only obstacle, us. Pilots of these experimental fighter planes and the ground personnel at Air Command Headquarters are unaware of the approaching menace. With the introduction of Laser Active, Pioneer now moves to the next level in the new world of interactive media. Another attempt at crossing over to the video game market came by way of the Pioneer Laser Active system. Introduced in 1993, the Laser Active was also capable of playing laser discs and CDs, of course, but also LDG titles. As for the games themselves, well, they were few and far between. Only about 20 titles were ever released in the US. Indeed, you'd have more luck with one of the Sega CD slash Genesis or Turbo Graphics boxes you could pop into the front of the machine. Coupled with the roughly $1,000 price tag and a need for several expensive add-ons like the aforementioned Sega box, or another box for, say, karaoke mic inputs, the Laser Active went belly up by 1995. Yes, the VCR is great, but it's only the beginning of the story. Add a Pioneer laser disc and get ready for the best show in town. Say the word and I'll hey, throw a lasso. What on. about your Pull kid's Nintendo? Where does he plug in? Put it all together with a Pioneer AV receiver. Expand the experience and go stereo by adding a pair of stereo speakers. Wrap the action all around you with a Pioneer surround sound system. Go for the ultimate and add the impact and power of a Pioneer projection monitor. Pioneer, it really is the best show in town. In 1995, the first AC3 encoded, for Dolby Digital Sound, titles were issued. The thing was, you needed an AC3 capable deck and an audio receiver equipped with an AC3 demodulator to access the soundtrack. Such home theater setups were still rather rare at the time. The Dolby Digital Signal was encoded into the old right analog audio channel of the disc. Older players could play the signal as well as static. Hmm. Hmm. Shortly thereafter, some players and titles were issued equipped with DTS audio capability. The same problems as the Dolby Digital Discs also applied to these discs as well. With that, let's talk about the confusing mess that is Laserdisc Audio. Basically, there is a digital track and an analog track. The digital track is similar to the later compact disc format and can sound fairly exceptional. 
The analog tracks generally don't sound as good, but like any audio, it all depends on how it was mastered. Garbage in, garbage out. What's more interesting is the left and right analog channels can contain different information. For example, the left analog audio stream could contain a commentary track. Most modern players will play this out both the left and right speakers, so you don't have to worry about connecting or disconnecting cables. Laserdisc also introduced true 5.1 surround sound to the mainstream. The most convenient option is DTS. This would take up the disc's digital audio track, and if your player has a Toslink output on the back, this will plug right into a modern AV receiver, and you're good to go. Less convenient, but more popular, is Dolby Digital. This would take up the right analog track and isn't compatible with modern AV equipment. A special modulator is needed to convert this analog signal into a normal Dolby Digital bitstream. Also interesting is that while DVDs usually advertise Dolby Digital, Laserdiscs typically refer to this by its more formal name, AC3. It's kind of cool. Laserdisc aficionados will argue Laserdisc surround mixes are superior to DVD, as they are of a higher bitrate. However, this is only partially true. A poorly mixed surround soundtrack playing at a higher bitrate will not sound as good as an expertly mixed surround soundtrack playing at a lower bitrate. Surround mixes found on today's optical media are often mixed completely different than a theatrical release, tailor-made for your living room. This didn't really exist in the Laserdisc era, and the sound mixes more closely resemble a theatrical sound mix. Today's models have another advantage. They can play a compact disc. And uh, this format, though, is where it was at, especially back in the 90s. In the 80s, it had uh, certainly its uh, day, but it was it was kind of just like an alternative format for VHS titles. S pretty much you were getting the same thing, just a little bit better picture. But once the Criterion Collection came along, some of the box sets and some of the actually filmmakers themselves were huge fans of Laserdiscs. You know, Kevin Smith uh, notoriously has uh, the Chasing Amy commentary track where he says, you know, F DVD <laughs> and uh, Robert Rodriguez, you know, Quentin Tarantino. I mean, these guys were Laserdisc fanatics. So the guys that were making movies wanted to see movies and they want to see it in the best way possible. And that's where this came in. The 90s was this amazing period for Laserdisc and just being a film aficionado. And on the cusp of that, there was some changes. Um, you know, more and more people were getting involved in, in these these cool presentations. Uh, the Criterion Collection definitely paved the way. Things came along, including uh, commentary tracks and extras and all the things we take for granted now. There was a lot of news coverage, especially when uh, James Cameron's Alien Special Edition came out. I mean, he, he was the guy that really said, look, I've got a film, and uh, I didn't really quite deliver the full package in the theaters, so now on this awesome elite home video format, I'm going to do an alternate cut of the film and show you the way, show it to you the way I want it to be. And that was like even a notch above like anything the Criterion Collection was doing. They were doing the, an absolute awesome job at you know preserving film and giving you a great um, a kind of insider look at things, but this was kicking up to a notch where this was a medium where you could actually get some sort of special version of a film created you know, for the filmmaker just for you. You know, James Cameron would often have his laser disc with like you know handwritten notes and well they weren't handwritten but they were you know little notes and and things like that telling you about how the format was great and how it was the best way to see his film. So it was totally an amazing period in the nineties when Laserdisc was on fire and it seemed every other month there was a, an, an amazing new title, either a catalog title or a new version of a classic that I loved coming out. So it's really what shaped me or helped shape me as a uh, film buff. Because there was magazines like Crazy Out of the Day. There was like, you know, Laser Views. Uh, Video Watchdog would give you a lot of information about stuff. And then there was uh, Widescreen Review, which is, this is uh, the magazine that, that taught me equally about um, Laserdisc and film and theatrical presentation because this is where you would learn about what all the different widescreen formats were and what it meant why some had just small black bars and some had big black bars on the image. So this was where it was at. And that also allowed me to go into the theater and look at films in a different way and, and pay attention to what the presentation was. Since the early 50s, Many films have been shot in various widescreen processes, such as Cinemascope and Panavision. Until now, 
Viewing these films on television removed almost half the original image from the home screen. However, MGM's deluxe letterbox editions now present widescreen films in their original form. Compare the chariot race sequence from Ben-Hur as it looked with its sides cut off, and now as it looks in letterbox. I fell in love with letterboxing. I know it drives a lot of people crazy off the bat. Um, so that kind of primed me to get ready for Laserdisc because you know, once letterboxing became the norm, uh, all these great studio titles were released. There was a Columbia House uh, club, so I joined that uh, pretty quickly and started to get you know, the Star Wars trilogy. That's what, you know, if you get the three uh, titles that come with the, the club, then you get that, then you cancel the club, and then you reorder it, and then get the Back to the Future trilogy. And I was getting stuff from uh, Laser Craze up in Boston. Tower Records used to sell them. Even all the places like Strawberries and, and the, the, the record stores like Coconuts and all that stuff would have them. Uh, Ken Crane's out in uh, California was a great place to order them from. I'd like to go back to... One of my experiences that I had when I was working at Bjorn's Audio Video, I worked in the Laserdisc section. He was kind of like, this section was like a record store, you know, we had, uh, instead of albums, we had Laserdisc. Um, Bjorn sold Laserdisc players and televisions, um, just top quality, high fidelity. Uh, I worked in the Laserdisc section, so, you know, I would help customers buy the Laserdisc, or we had... Same thing like Previews Magazine, you know, it came out, or Previews Catalog, it came out like a couple months in advance, and you could select the movies that you wanted to buy on Laserdisc. Uh, so I would help customers pre-order things, and um, I had mentioned in, in one of my other episodes about how when you see somebody once a week, like you do, say your local comic book guy, you see them once a week, uh, you kind of make friends, friends with them. And uh, anyhow, I had a, a couple that I had made friends with. They would come in every week. Like the the, the new Laserdisc would come out. Um, I don't remember. It was like Tuesday or Wednesday. I kind of think it was like Wednesday. Maybe the new Laserdisc would come out. So people would come in every Wednesday to pick up their new Laserdisc that they had pre-ordered. Uh, and this couple would come in. Young couple would come in every week, man. So I, you know, got to know them and help them. And in fact, it was kind of funny how. They actually invited me to their wedding. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many people would invite their Laserdisc guy to their wedding, but I bet, like I said, man, when you see somebody once a week uh, for a year or whatever, um, you kind of consider my friend. This is Lawrence, an employee here at Trex. Lawrence, can you tell us a little bit about your Laserdisc you have here in the store and how, well, how things are going off, so far? Well, let's say that uh, this is the latest technology as far as uh, audio and visual. Um, we have the biggest selection here. It's, uh, it's just a wave of the future. How about all the space back there behind you? Is that going to be used in, in the yeah. future? As I say, we have the latest uh, selection right now, but right now this is what we have plans for. We have three more. Okay. We also have the latest releases, such as uh, Ghost, which, according to Laserdisc, comes out at $29.98, as in videos, it'll be as high as $89.98. And what we're going to be doing with these things are going through them and making sure that our, our barcode stickering is, uh, is correct and up to date. Uh, from that point, we're going to put it on the floor, and uh, this is going to... This is going to become our sales stock, and our sales stock is going to increase to anywhere from 1500 to 2500 And what about your rental stock? Our rental stock, we were talking about, and we're looking at uh, carrying around 500 to 600 discs, and that's going to start anytime in the next two weeks to a month. How have sales been so far here at the store for Laserdisc? Sales have been very good. Uh, as a matter of fact, since we got the discs in uh, the last couple of days, this large increase of them, we've had customers in here going through boxes that were opened already, flipping through things that we hadn't quite gotten ready and we got it ready for them on the spot so that they could buy it. That's great. Behind the scenes here at the CD Superstore with Guy. Guy, which one, how many of these boxes are Laserdisc here? Uh, there are about 26, 27 boxes. I'd say 22 of them are full of Laserdiscs and they usually run through that amount right there. We've got uh, larger boxes back there in the corner which hold about twice that many. So we've probably got 1,300. <laughs>
Come to Audio Video Plus, your home for VHS, Beta, and Laserdisc. Over 63,929 movies to rent or buy. I rent all my movies from Audio Video Plus. Need the laser disc? How about Beta? Not the fish! We also sell high-end video equipment. We, we love, love audio, audio video, video plus. plus. Cameraman J.D. Legere shot this exclusive footage of the gloved one shopping spree at Dave's Laser Place in L.A. He was followed by an employee with a bin on a cart, and then he just handed laser disc after laser disc to the employee. Jackson got dozens of laser discs, costing about 40 bucks a pop. Included in his selections was Disney's Goofy Movie. Laserdisc also wasn't region coded, so you can get discs from Japan imported. So you can get, you know, I got some cool music videos and you know films that weren't released over here in the states. Hier die Platte selbst. Auf ihrer Oberfläche sind Bild und zwei Kanäle Ton gespeichert. With Laserdisc, you won't believe the difference. You know, Laserdisc isn't quite as plug-and-play as a DVD. If you want to listen to DTS and Dolby Digital and all this stuff, you're going to need to look for a specific player. You might have to get some uh, strange external equipment, etc. So uh, I've got it hooked up to a Sony HD SXRD projector, and I've gone crazy. I've got a time-based corrector, which makes the chroma like rock solid. Like the reds and the purples and everything like that that used to be really noisy are amazing looking now. I've got a 3D comb filter that it runs through and an HD hub that upgrades it to 1080p, but that's all total nuttiness. It's just that I'm a fan. It's fun. Um, a lot of people collect it uh, just because it's big. Got this laser disc. Wow. It barely fits in there. Ooh, will it? I don't know. We'll just put that in there. Hopefully it'll be like a a laser disc, laser light show, like, I don't know what. Oh, it's already starting to do its laser light show. Oh, it's going by like on ridges, so. You can see, folks, it's so big, it won't actually spin in there. Quentin Tarantino is somewhere rolling in his grave. Ooh, wow, look at that. You made it into like a giant Malibu Frisbee. Oh, oh I lost my sugar. In Salt Lake City. Oh, why did I go One of the most widely spread bits of misinformation that I've regularly seen about laser discs is that they've all got disc rot. You can't watch any of these old films. It's such a shame because they've all rotted away due to disc rot. The images are unwatchable. Well, as you can see, this is an early 80s laser disc. And it's not bad at all, other than the fact it's 4-3 ratio, but beggars can't be choosers. Now, I'm not saying disc rot doesn't happen. You can see on this disc here, it doesn't reflect the light properly. There's a kind of misting on the left-hand side there, a bit of a mottled effect. It is something that does happen. It's just not as common as people make out. Here's a video with disc rot. This is what it looks like. See these little black lines coming across here, like little meteorites flying across the screen? That's what disc rot looks like. Now, I'm really close up, as you can see here, and overall... It's not that bad. I managed to watch this film. However, there are some films that are worse than others. For example, this one, only Disc 3 does this, but it does have some pretty bad rot on it. So let me show you what that looks like. This is the worst I've experienced so far. Now, again, I'll be zooming up on this just so you can get an idea. But that's what that looks like. Proper video noise coming across there. 
Now even the simplest laser disc film comes on two sides of a disc, whereas the more complicated ones are spread across multiple discs. Therefore it really makes sense to get a player that can play both sides of the disc without you having to flip it over manually. It would get on your nerves a little bit. Now this one has a quick change, so it can flip sides pretty quickly. So let's have a look what happens. So we just get to the end there, that's side A. As you can see on the screen, it's saying side A to B. You can see the laser disc player going through its motions there, a little light flashing at the top. So it takes, I don't know, perhaps five seconds or so, perhaps a little bit longer, but then you get onto side B. That's a lot better than getting up out of your chairs. Now let's fast forward a little bit further on in the movie. Saw something there, so I'll just rewind. I want to have a look at that explosion. So you can see here, shoot those, dodgy moustache. Look at that there. Now that's in slow motion to start with, but look what I can do with the jog shuttle dial here. I can get it moving in super slow motion. I can freeze it, bring it forward frame by frame. Look at this now, I'm moving it frame by frame. Now you try doing that with a DVD player or a Blu-ray. I don't think there's anything that enables you to do that nowadays. You can jump around a little bit, pause and stuff, go frame by frame, but not with this level of control. See, the remote that comes with it is very comprehensive. You've got a button for everything here. And included at the bottom is a jog shuttle dial, something you don't see on modern day remotes, but I remember being quite the vogue in the 90s. You can skip through the video here, but you can also go through it frame by frame by moving the little wheel around here. It says, I'm butthead. He's numbnuts. Okay, not the funniest line in the movie, but there you go. Now let's have a look at the video of it. I managed to dig out the video recorder. Just look at the quality of this, by the way. It's terrible. But these are called dub titles. This is when someone listens to a dub and then just types it in as the subtitles. I'm Dumbo, he's Mickey Mouse. So for years, I thought that was the line in the film where it was just some guy making it up. Now just look at the quality again as I flip back to the laser disc. Look how much better that is. You can see what a strength laser disc was compared to video, which of course was the dominant format at the time. And I find it really hard to believe that I was able to watch that back then and think it was okay. Greetings again. Um, I could almost see your eyes bulge when you saw I got a uh, laser disc player here. So I figured, you know, what the hell, I'll give you a demonstration. Um, in 1991, I got my first Laserdisc player, and then as such, um, did a lot of reading up about the, the, the format and, and so forth. And, and basically, I was a video freak, and uh, I just wanted the best quality format I could find for uh, my movies and TV shows. Hello YouTubers, this is Cessna Ace back again with another video, a video disc ads video pertaining to laser discs. Because uh, when I got to the end of the previous video that I did, I still had a lot yet to show. And I've exacerbated the problem because uh, over the past weekend I went out to the flea market and bought several more. This is uh, called Laser Karaoke Video Sing Along Top 10 Country Hits, Volume 23. U.S. release, factory sealed. And generally, my rule of thumb is, if it is a dead format and it's still sealed, it stays that way. All of the ones I bought in this lot were sealed. The only time I opened any was when I had two copies. Because I may be crazy, but not overly so. Now you can still get some sealed discs and you'll notice from looking at some of those discs earlier on that people tend to leave the polythene on the outside of them to protect them. These things were really bought by proper film collectors, film buffs, people that didn't mind paying through the nose to get a special version of their favourite film. Volume 32, not sealed. That songs. Because it's not sealed, I have a sealed copy. This um, is a film I saw in the theater on opening night. Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Now, while most home video labels eventually jump ship from Pioneer to Image once once Image became bigger than Pioneer. 
Paramount Home Video remained loyal to Pioneer. Disney is one of those companies that switched from Pioneer to Image. And because Image distributed so much porn, Disney said, Stop it! This is Asian Heat Volume 5, The Joy Suck Club. What a title. Every time Image came out with a new imprint for porn, wouldn't you know it, Disney would find out about it. And what do you know? Image would create another imprint. Okay, this is uh, release Z0329. This is DVD. In 1996, the first DVD players hit the market. At the time, DVD players started around $400 and discs started at around $20, whereas Laserdisc players started around $300, yet discs started at around $30. Around the same time, PC manufacturers adopted the DVD-ROM technology for their machines. Between this major rollout and relatively low introductory price, which dropped further pretty quickly, DVDs immediately took a major bite out of Laserdisc sales. Despite a few attempts at creating a hybrid DVD Laserdisc system, Laserdisc simply couldn't compete. Back when I bought my first DVD player in 1998, this was next to it on the shelf, and I wasn't sure whether to pay the extra for the DVD and Laserdisc player just to hedge my bets in case DVD never took off. Now at the time, I bought the DVD player for £400, but it did include a copy of Starship Troopers, so not all bad. Now you can see even on the Pioneer website for the time, they were hedging their bets as well. They were making more DVL-909s, the Laserdisc player version, at the top, 6,000 a month, whereas the DVD player, they were only starting making 3,000 of those a month. In the year 2000, the last US Laserdisc release came out, and in 2001, the last one came out in Japan. But in 1998, this was pretty much cutting edge technology with digital memory, each side play, all the latest whiz bang features. Perhaps the most important of which is the ability to play both PAL and NTSC discs, because at the time in the UK, a lot of discs were imported because they weren't available here. Now, they did try to improve the video quality of laser discs by releasing these squeeze LDs. Now, these were only released in Japan, there were only a few titles released. These were anamorphically squeezed laser discs so that when you squash the video down, you got more horizontal resolution than you would on a traditional laser disc. However, in my experience, the results, there's not much in it at all, really. And of course, unfortunately, with them being Japanese, they've all got Japanese hard coded subtitles on them. Now, Laserdisc did have one last hurrah, in Japan at least, with a HD version, the High Vision Muse player. Very expensive players, very expensive disc to play on them. And the the reason DVD took over from Laserdisc more than anything else was convenience and price. Obviously, Laserdisc is the forebear of DVD. Uh, you know that's what uh, paved the way to let people know that all the stuff we got on DVD and nowadays on Blu-ray was uh, a viable you know thing, and that people would actually pay for it. Now, luckily, I have three copies of Lethal Weapon on Laserdisc now, and DVD and Blu-ray, so I can compare those three for video quality. So let's have a look at this still. This is Blu-ray, as you can see at the bottom right there. And then that's DVD. Ignore the aspect ratio changes. That's just me getting the settings slightly wrong. And then finally, that's Laserdisc. Now, that is really soft, isn't it? And quite washed out looking as well. If we just go back a second and have a look at the hand on the left there, notice the extra detail that you see even just on the DVD, and then even more, of course, on the Blu-ray. You can see the wrinkles on the palm of the hand. Now, let's just have a look at another still here. So that's the Blu-ray one, first of all. And then there's the DVD, slightly different aspect ratio again, but just look at the detail in there. And then finally, back to the Laserdisc. So, a lot softer. Now, 
This might be because the DVD I've got is special edition, remastered, etc, etc, whereas the Laserdisc is just the original video pressing. Back in the day, they weren't too great at putting stuff onto video that had been on film, and they've got better over the years. So, whereas your Laserdisc might be stuck in time, you might find that a more recent version of a DVD looks better than the one that came out back in the day. But with all that said and done, I'm afraid DVDs, to me, do look considerably better than Laserdiscs. But whilst there's people out there that'll disagree and say you can do some upscaling and all that kind of stuff, it's all academic because Blu-ray looks better than both of them. And don't let people talk too much trash about laser discing in general. I was just uh, talking about, uh, I've run into a lot of people that feel that they were burned because they bought into Laserdisc as the eternal format, apparently. They thought this was going to be the future for all time of video. And I remember in the 80s hearing about high definition. I remember seeing pieces about high-definition display uh, demos in Japan, so I knew that was coming. And then shortly after I got into Laserdisc, I kept hearing about a digital versatile disc, or digital video disc, as it was called at the time. I knew DVD was on the horizon, and then when I made the switch to DVD, I knew that something like Blu-ray was going to have to happen because high def was around the corner. Um, So it's kind of weird to think that there was some guy that was so invested in Laserdisc uh, that he really wants, you know, every film does still be released on it and uh in its you know analog film quality so that said it is pretty cool now there's still something really magical about the size of these discs for example i'll just eject the cd mechanism there that's what the cd tray looks like but this one also of course eject the full front of the thing to get the laser disc tray out of there look at the size of that there's something slightly amusing yet pretty impressive about laser discs the actual size of them it's just something that you don't get nowadays everything's gone smaller compact or digital you don't actually get things like this and for some reason i'm just really interested in silly old formats that don't make sense anymore but to me i find them charming anyway you- a very special episode for you today a special laser disc edition but i just it's just funny how you know just seeing seeing just seeing something like this this is tower records little sticker can just bring back so many memories and you know such good times and thinking about first date pulp fiction (laughs) oh that's awesome I've got to say, though, it has earned its own place in my AV rack, which is something I wasn't expecting it to do when I first picked it up. Besides which, I've got all these films to watch, and a good film is still a good film, even if it's a little bit soft around the edges. Pioneer Laserdisc brand video disc player. Video for those who really care about audio. So now you know the whole logic behind the Laserdisc. But the remarkable part is not merely how the laser disc system works, but what it brings you. A world of entertainment and information without limit. Here's some chocolate ice cream. Yeah, it's chocolate, all right. So this is how it ends. This time. But there will be another time. We'll be back.
home. As I say, the, the, the difficulty in recording at home it, it is the, the money. It would cost you several thousand dollars to set up the laser system so you could record That's the right. stuff at home at this stage. The second they come out with laser disc recorders for a mass market uh, uh, consumption, I'm going to buy one and convert all of my home movies to laser disc because I don't like the idea of the fact that VHS videotapes do not have a tremendously long lifespan, between 15 and 30 years. While it's a long time, it is not eternal, whereas laser discs, discs are next to eternal. They're close. They last a long time, a very long time, and the picture quality is just fantastic. It will be the quality of the original.